In this recording, we're going to have an overview of the application layer. We're going to examine the principles of network applications. Our goal is to look at the conceptual and implementation aspects of network application protocols. We're going to look at their transport layer service models. Um, we're going to look at the client server paradigm and contrast that to the peer to peer paradigm. And then we're going to learn about protocols by looking at um, popular application level protocols such as HTTP and DNS. And then we're going to look at how we create uh, network applications using the socket API. So some examples of network applications include email or web or text messaging, um, remote login, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, multi-user network games, uh, streaming stored video as you might do say when you're using YouTube or Hulu or Netflix, um, using voice over IP such as with Skype, or real-time video conferencing, uh, like what we do with Zoom, or social networking, or search, and the list goes on. So in order to create the network application, we're going to write programs that run on different end systems, potentially different end systems, that will communicate over a network. For example, one might have some web server software that communicates with uh, browser software. Now, there is no need to write any software for network core devices. And uh, this is because network core devices, uh, that is things like routers and switches, do not run user applications. These applications um, run on end systems. And since the applications run on end systems, we can have rapid application development and propagation. So to give um, an example, we have all these end devices, the um, like a, an iPhone, over there or a um, workstation over here and servers down here and these uh, machines these hosts will have all five layers of our uh, reference model um, implemented and remember we are talking about the application layer in these next series of um, videos so the application layers in these de devices can talk to each other now uh, Network applications can be structured using either a client-server approach or a peer-to-peer -peer approach. In the client-server approach, you have a server that is a host that's always on, and typically it has a permanent IP address. Uh, these days, we keep these servers in data centers so we can scale a bit more efficiently. And then we have our clients, which are end hosts that will communicate with servers. These uh, clients can come and go, they, so they're intermittently connected, and they potentially have dynamic IP addresses. And in the client-server approach, the clients do not communicate directly with each other. Whereas in the peer-to-peer -peer, um, um, architecture, this is what you may see, say, if you're using a torrent, there is no server that is always on, and now we have arbitrary end systems that will communicate directly. The peers will request service from other peers and provide service in return to other peers. The peer-to-peer -peer architecture has the benefit that of being self-scalable. In other words, every time a peer comes in, it brings with it some additional capacity as well as its own service demands. And so this additional capacity allows the um, architecture uh, to grow. Um, the peers uh, now are intermittently connected and they um, change IP addresses. And this therefore means that you need to have um, some complex management protocols built for the peer-to-peer um, -peer architecture. I should uh, point out that um, the newer versions of Windows, for example, Windows 10, um, now allows you to um, get your um, Windows updates in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion from the first machine that um, downloads the updates. This actually helps those updates to uh, get to other machines in a much more efficient manner um, without placing undue strain on Microsoft's uh, computers, for example. Now, we're going to have uh, processes um, that are communicating um, with the application layer. A process, is, for the purposes of this course, simply a program that is running within a host. Now, when you have uh, two... Uh, processes on the same host uh, communicating, 
then they communicate typically using something called inter-process communication. Um, and this is defined by the operating system. Now, processes in different hosts uh, can communicate by exchanging messages. So you would have a client process and a server process. The uh, client process is a process that initiates the communication, whereas the server process is a process that waits around, sits around and waits to be contacted. You can think of the uh, client actually as the master and the server as the slave. Now, I should uh, point out that with the peer-to-peer um, -peer architecture, the uh, same hosts will have a client process and a server process. Um, say you're download, you, you have some files that you're sharing with a torrent or getting some file from uh, a torrent. Um, you may be downloading some chunks of that file at the same time that you are uploading um, parts of the file that you've already downloaded to other um, machines in the torrent. So you have a client uh, process um, and a server process to um, get and distribute uh, the pieces of the file respectively. So we also have this notion of a socket. Okay, a socket a process will uh, send and receive messages to and from its socket. Okay, you can think of the socket as being like a door. Okay, that door is between basically the application and the um, transport layers. And so when a process has data to send, it shoves that message out um, of the door, okay? Think of a door where, you know, you have the mail service come and collect, there's a little slot in the door, and the postal service collects the uh, mail from that door, okay? And once that uh, message has been sent out, then the sending process will rely on the transport infrastructure on the other side of the door to deliver the message to a socket at the receiving process. So um, to use that uh, analogy of a door with a postal service on one side, you um, will simply um, rely on the mail service to um, take that message that is sent through the socket and deliver it on the other side. Now, how do we identify um, processes? To identify these processes, we um, have to address them. And we do that using, um, first for the device, we have to have a unique 32-bit IP address. Now, a good question to ask is if that IP address um, of the host is sufficient for identifying the process. And the answer is that no, it is not, because you could potentially have many processes that are running on the same host. So. Um, the ident we're going to have um, an identifier that would include both the IP address and the port number that is associated with a process on a host. Um, so, for example, um, this port number, uh, these port numbers are well known so, um, for certain applications. So, for example, HTTP by default listens on port 80. SMTP, which we use for email, uh, by default listens on port 25. So, for example, um, say we want to send an HTTP message to gaia.cs.umass.edu, then we will address that message to um, you know the web the IP address to Gaia, which is given below 128.119.245.12, and the port number is port 80. So your application layer protocol will define the types of messages that are exchanged. Um, that is the uh, request and response messages. Um, the message syntax, in other words, which fields are in the, um, those messages, how are these um, fields um, separated. It will also um, specify the meaning of the information in the fields, and it will also tell us some rules for when and how processes will send and respond to messages. Now, protocols, as we said earlier, can either be open or proprietary. Open protocols are um, frequently defined in RFCs, and this allows um, one to um, have interoperability. Um, so the way this works, for example, protocols that are defined by the um, Internet Engineering Task Force and defined in RFCs, before you get to the RFC stage, you will have at least um, two independent implementations. And so people will then come and test these in an interoperability uh, test. Right? So I get my client, which I built, reading this by reading the standard and I will operate it with 
someone else's server that was also built implementing uh, by following the standard and we see you know if they work together um, protocols can also be proprietary such as Skype um, where a company owns the standard for that protocol and builds the uh, clients that work over that protocol so what kinds of um, transport service might an application need well an application um, might need uh, data integrity which basically means that we want to ensure that all the data that we get we send from one end say the server um, gets to um, the client there are some other applications such as um, audio where we can tolerate some loss we rely on the user to um, catch you know any breaks in communication and say you know sorry I didn't get that or maybe the user's brain can actually fill in what um, was said during a gap in communication some applications will also require low delay um, to be effective things like internet telephony and um, the interactive games that some of you might play these will require some load delays other applications will require will require minimum amount of bandwidth to be effective things such as uh, multimedia and then there are other applications um, like um, HTTP the web or email that are elastic in other words in their bandwidth requirements or throughput requirements in other words these applications will make use of whatever throughput they get. If they get a lot, good, they make full use of that. If they get very little, then you know they also use the little that they have. And then um, applications may also require security in terms of encryption or data integrity. Okay. So this um, following slide summarizes the transport service requirements for some common applications. So for file transfer, we want reliability, in other words, no loss, and it's elastic in its throughput, uh, but it's not time sensitive. Email is also, um, we require that the tr transport is reliable, and it is elastic in its transport, in its throughput requirements, and it is not uh, time sensitive. Web documents, also we don't want to have them transferred with no loss, and um, we want to make sure that they're elastic in their travel, uh, throughput requirements and that um, their transfer is uh, not time sensitive. Real-time audio and video um, is loss tolerant um, and it has minimum uh, throughput requirements. So for um, audio, we want to have um, rates of between 5 kilobits per second and 1 megabit per second. And um, it is time sensitive on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Um, video, we want to support to require at least um, 10 kilobits per second to 5 megabits per second. Um, stored audio and video is also loss tolerant, but we only need a few kilobits per second up. And it is um, time sensitive, but um, it's relatively speaking, it is uh, the most forgiving. Why is this so? You might. Um, wonder for stored audio and video. Well, all the buffering that we see when we um, use, um, you know, YouTube or Netflix, um, that allows one to um, get um, some frames even up to a, a few seconds later. As long as the um, data is coming in at a steady rate, we're fine. Um, text messaging, um, want to ensure that there is no loss of data it's um, elastic in its throughput requirements but it is not um, time sensitive so on the internet we have um, two protocols uh, mainly that will provide uh, transport uh, service you have tcp the transmission control protocol and udp the user datagram protocol TCP provides for reliable transport between a sending and a receiving process. Remember, reliable transport is ensuring that all the data that is sent at one end makes its way to the other end. Um, we also want flow control. Flow control is when um, the sender won't uh, send so much data that it overwhelms the receiver. And then we have congestion control where we um, throttle or slow down um, the sender when the network is um, congested or overloaded. 
Um, CCP incidentally does not provide any uh, timing or minimum throughput guarantees or connection um, oriented security or connect or security in general. Um, then TCP is also connection oriented, which basically means that before any data is transferred over a TCP connection, there is some kind of connection, and I use connection in quotes here, um, between the um, client and server process. UDP um, stands for User Datagram Protocol, and it allows for unreliable data transfer between a, between a sending and receiving process. UDP doesn't provide any reliability or flow control or congestion or control or timing, throughput guarantees, security or connection setup. So looking at all these things that UDP does not uh, provide, one can ask, why should we even bother? Why is there a UDP? Well, there is a UDP because there are certain things, as we will see um, at the start of the next chapter, there are certain things that um, one needs to carry out rapidly. And having to go through TCP, which you know would make sure there's reliable data transfer, um, but it may potentially be late. So it's better to go with UDP. So in terms of internet applications, um, here are some uh, transport protocols for these applications. So um, for email, um, the application layer protocol is SMTP, which is defined in RFC 2821, and that uses TCP. Um, remote terminal access, um, we want Telnet, defined in RFC 854, also using TCP. FTP for file transfer is um, running, can run over either um, TCP or UDP. Um, internet uh, telephony, again using SIP or um, some proprietary standards such as Skype, you, we have we use either TCP or UDP. Okay. Now, one question um, which we haven't answered is how do we provide security? Right? Remember, in a previous video, we had mentioned that there are now security considerations at all layers. Well, um, TCP and UDP in their original forms provided no encryption, which meant that if you're using TCP or UDP and you sent any passwords, those passwords were sent in clear, in clear text into the, um, into the socket and they would traverse the internet in clear text, which is a bad thing, if I uh, must say so. So what SSL does, uh, SSL stands for the Secure Sockets Layer. It provides for an encrypted TCP connection. And we, um, SSL provides for data integrity and endpoint authentication. Now, SSL is an application layer protocol. Um, applications are going to talk to SSL libraries that will then turn around and talk to TCP. Um, the SSL socket API um, requires that clear text passwords sent into the socket will traverse the internet encrypted. Okay, we're going to touch on um, security requirements for uh, TCP in um, well a few videos uh, closer to the uh, latter th um, third of this course. And this ends this video. In the next video, we're going to look at the web and HTTP. Thank you.